tricyclic compound. So these uh, products, natural products, uh, are produced in various uh, algae, uh, red or green, and with nice enzymatic machinery, it's pretty straightforward. But if you want, as a chemist, to do that at the bench, uh, it gets way more uh, complex. But uh, we knew how to do oxybromination. I didn't talk about it, but we also knew how to make uh, cyclization. And we thought pretty maybe naively that from a common uh, geranial precursor, uh, we should be able to do oxybromination or um, cyclobromination, depending on whether we had no external nucleophile or an external nucleophile. That was a bit naive maybe because uh, bromocyclization is, is really difficult and there's been a lot of work to put into it. Uh, so far, the, the golden standard was the BDSB region developed by Snyder. Uh, which was designed so that there's no external nucleophile. And it's the one that works best uh, to access, for instance, uh, these tricyclic compounds. Uh, that's from 2009. In 2017, uh, Yamamoto was able to show that using this type of catalyst with um, uh, this uh, electrophilic brominating reagent, uh, you could achieve something similar, but uh, with, uh, in an asymmetric fashion. Uh, also, Professor Gulder, without uh, hypervalence iodine uh, using HFIP, uh, recently uh, demonstrated that this type of uh, cyclization was good. Uh, for our part, we tried our system, and our first tries were just uh, miserable failure with quantitative yield of the dibromo, uh, dibromination of double bond, because we thought we had no external nucleophile, but bromide is pretty good nucleophile. Half of the idea was validated because when you add ethanol, you can get a mixture of dibromination and oxybromination, which was not really satisfying. So we went on to screen a variety of, or I say we, but I didn't do the experimental work. Um, Tatiana Greifer did. Um, starting from benzyl geranyl uh, derivative, screening solvents, room temperatures, uh, the type of bromide source, uh, iodine-3 or iodine-5, and getting uh, various uh, mixtures of compound. Actually, you can pretty much get everything at the same time in very low yield. This is a typical example. A few percent of dibromination, allylic bromination, a bit of cyclization, mixture, monocyclic, tricyclic, a ring contraction product with loss of the bromide, but uh, she, she was hardworking and she managed to uh, devise uh, conditions uh, that were suitable uh, to make mostly uh, the cyclized product, a bit of the tricyclic product, but you can convert everything with an acidic treatment to the tri tricyclic uh, compound. And the key here is high dilution, very polar solvent, which is similar to um, uh, other conditions to achieve this type of selectivity, a soluble bromide source, and a slow addition to get a good 67% overall yield of the tricyclic uh, compound. Uh, this also works with the tolyl, uh, para-anisyl, uh, meta-anisyl gives a mixture of um, isomers, uh, also auto-anisyl uh, works fine, and here you can see the, uh, the regional select, the relative configuration between the, the bromine and the H bond here at this uh, junction. When we change a bit the substrates, uh, putting a phenol, uh, for instance, you get a mixture of the monocyclic, tricyclic, but also that tricyclic with that seven member ring. Here, another X-ray structure, seeing that uh, seven member ring. Uh, with the chain shorter by one CH2 here, uh, you get the iso isocymo barbital type product. Uh, with pretty good yields. Uh, other nucleophiles, such as guanidine, can also cyclize. And with the farnesyl chain, uh, we could only get 18% of the tetracyclic product, but we were already uh, quite happy with that. And uh, Tanya here, who defended her PhD in 2017, was also able to show that that dibromination here uh, can work for these substrates uh, really easily. And also using this ammonium in conjunction with the uh, 
uh, acetate, uh, you can get the oxybromination. So basically from one substrate using one uh, carefully chosen uh, hypervalent iodine regions with the corresponding bromide source, uh, lithium bromide, uh, silyl bromide, ammonium bromide, you can uh, steer the reactivity towards three different compounds uh, at will by playing on the condition. Uh, and this was uh, really interesting uh, in terms of chemoselectivity and uh, we try to uh, continue on uh, this cyclization by targeting a bioactive compound. And I will talk a bit more about mechanism on that second part, uh, which is, sorry, uh, here, uh, avibactam. So maybe, maybe many of you are not familiar with this uh, compound. So avibactam was approved by the FDA in 2015. It's a beta-lactamase inhibitor, which means that it brings back the activity of a beta-lactam antibiotic uh, in a resistant uh, strain. Uh, there are analogs here. This one with double bond and methyl is a better inhibitor. Uh, this one is inhibitor and slightly antibiotic. Uh, this is really important because uh, before the approval of uh, this drug, uh, some infections uh, were basically with a 50% chance of killing people uh, bringing back um, therapeutics to prior to flaming discovery of penicillin. So it's really important, and especially with the rise of uh, resistance. Nevertheless, they are quite uh, complex molecules to access. So avibactam synthesis has been streamlined down to 10 steps, but this more recent analog is still uh, 20 steps. And the disconnection they all share is the bicyclic ring uh, is always made by uh, this uh, diamine uh, reacting uh, with a triphosphine. And we thought maybe we can uh, bring an alternative disconnection uh, using this unsaturated uh, cycle and with an electrophile uh, triggering um, a cyclization of the nitrogen. Obviously, uh, we choose to study hypervalent iodine mediated uh, electrophilic bromination because we had some experience with it and we choose that um, model substrate with the uh, oxy uh, and oxy urea uh, for the cyclization. The main challenge we saw was that with the activation of the double bond uh, there could be a N cyclization which in theory we wanted for uh, avibactam versus O-cyclization, which is generally more uh, well-known if you use like NBS for instance on that type of substrate. Same as usual, a uh, lot of reaction conditions were screened and it turned out that the O-cyclization, which was not uh, the one we, we wanted the most, uh, was the first one uh, we were able to uh, optimize with 78% yield uh, using uh, pyridinium uh, hydrobromide uh, and trifluoroacetoxy uh, uh, iodobenzene uh, as the hypervalent iodine species. In that case, the scope is generally pretty uh, broad with good yields, 70, 80, 90% yield, uh, with no influence of the group on nitrogen. You can vary the group here on uh, the oxygen, and then you can vary the chain uh, from uh, allyl to metallyl to proteal, uh, which goes through the uh, five exo uh, cyclization mode. If you go to steril or prenyl, then you get the six member ring through a six endo uh, cyclization mode. And in the case of a longer chain, uh, homo allyl chain, uh, you get the six exo uh, cyclization to go uh, to the six member ring. We were able, I see question answers, sorry. Uh, do you have any live questions? Not really. Okay, uh, I'll go back to that later on the chat. Uh, we were also able to um, use to optimize the end cyclization, but uh, with sorry, uh, lower yields here, only thirty-eight percent, and that's the best we could do. And the key here is to use uh, an ammonium bromide, uh, tetrabutyl ammonium bromide, and no longer a pyridinium um, bromide. 
And here the scope is pretty narrow and the yields are always between even lower 10 to 40 percent. And we could not uh, get any better yield and always the five numbering. We were trying to understand uh, why uh, this reaction was different. And so we added tempo and we had a much better yield, uh, but with the incorporation of the tempo and no longer of the bromide. And so we optimized quickly, which was basically getting rid of the bromide and just using tempo. And in that case, uh, you get the end cyclization incorporation of the tempo. Here you can see that end cyclized uh, ring with the, the tempo here with an excellent 70% uh, yield. And here the, the yields were much uh, better between 60, 70% uh, yield. And the scope was also uh, broader with variation on uh, the nitrogen substitution. You can even use an allyl uh, group. And also uh, with the metallyl and crotial uh, steril and perennial and in some way this uh, spiral compound also can be uh, obtained. Uh, since we wanted to use these compounds uh, for um, making analogs, uh, we try to uh, explore the, the synthetic scope and so we try to deprotect and uh, the various groups, for instance the benzyl group here or here, can be hydrolyzed and hydrogenolyzed, keeping the bromide here or uh, keeping uh, the tempo group. Uh, you can use the bromide as a linchpin and for instance, we did a simple uh, azide substitution and reduction to get the, the free amine. And even the tempo group, uh, because this is uh, always a problem is when you put something that you cannot use, but tempo can be cleaved uh, oxidatively with the MCPBA giving a ketone or reductively uh, giving an alcohol and then you're pretty much uh, set to, to do whatever you want with this. We were still puzzled about the, the mechanism and that big difference between the end cyclization and the O cyclization. And when uh, we did a, a few control groups and control experiments with that substrate here, having a benzyl and no longer the uh, oxy, benzyl oxy group. And in that case, the O cyclization works like a charm, 80% no problem, but the end cyclization conditions only after prolonged reaction time give O cyclization and the tempo conditions uh, give uh, nothing, which means that the NO moiety is mandatory for the end cyclization. The other thing we did is to uh, prepare that cyclopropyl uh, substituted uh, substrate and the O cyclization uh, condition you have a mixture of uh, six endo and five exo modes uh, cyclase product, but with the cyclopropyl intact, which points towards a cationic, ionic uh, mechanism. On the other hand, uh, the end cyclization conditions, whether with the, the bromide or with the tempo, always uh, gave compound resulting from the opening of the cyclopropyl, which would uh, hint toward a radical mechanism. So on the uh, bigger picture, try to get a mechanism proposal that would take all these things uh, into account. Uh, what we believe is uh, if you have a high prevalent iodine tip type uh, diacetoxy, ditrefluoroacetoxy, in the presence of uh, most uh, bromide sources, you would presumably go through ligand changes to get at least that mixed species. And what we think happens is reductive elimination at that stage, uh, giving the iodobenzene and the actual uh, bromination species uh, is the hypobromide, which reacts with the double bond, uh, getting to the uh, bromine brominarium and cyclization of uh, the more uh, nucleophilic um, carbonyl uh, gives the O cyclization product. So from there, how do you explain that uh, you can have an end cyclization? Uh, that means that you no longer activate the double bond, but probably activate uh, nitrogen. And for that, you need to generate another species. And remember that only happen with uh, ammonium bromide. And tetrabutyl ammonium bromide uh, can react with a uh, hypervalent uh, iodine reagent to give, uh, through the reductive emination, a really specific uh, ammonium bromate 
species. That was initially described by uh, Kirchning and later on by the late Professor uh, uh, Moons. Um, and maybe what we believe here happens is that this species is electrophilic, but uh, prefers reacting with the nitrogen, giving an um, N BR bond that can be uh, homolytically cleaved uh, to give uh, N center radical 5 azo cyclization, uh, giving this radical, which is consistent then with the opening of the cyclopropyl and uh, re recombination with the, the bromide uh, bromine radical would give the, the uh, n cyclized product. Uh, in the absence of the oxygen stabilizing group, this can go back presumably to uh, the uh, hypobromite and activate the double bond and what uh, takes place with the uh, n benzyl substrate. Uh, when there's no bromide, uh, and using the, the bispivalent, uh, we assume that we have uh, activation of the nitrogen and then same thing, uh, homolytic cleavage with the reductive elimination and recombination with the tempo in the end to get the uh, end cyclized uh, product. So this was the work of uh, Laure Peyron, who developed a PhD in 2019. Uh, and so she was able to devise uh, three different cyclization and uh, some adibactam analogs are on the way for their synthesis and their uh, evaluation uh, in collaboration with the uh, Michel Arthur at Sorbonne uh, University. So this ends the stoichiometric uh, part of my talk. And now we talk about photo-induced aerobic iodorizing catalysis. So this is the first time I presented, so I apologize if I make any mistake, uh, but it, this is really exciting for us. So as I presented, the, the driving force in all this uh, reaction is the generation of uh, one equivalent of iodoirene as um, the, by the final reductive elimination. And this is standard uh, reaction. What has been done for a while is uh, using uh, stoichiometric oxidants that uh, leads to a stoichiometric amount of waste. Uh, there are several oxidants that have been used. I'd say the most versatile is uh, MCPBA. And what would be even better if it's the oxidant is oxygen. Uh, overall, uh, maybe through peroxide, the waste would be only water. Uh, the thing is, uh, the oxygen cannot oxidize uh, iodine, so you need something in, in between an electron transfer mediator, some kind of redox relay uh, to perform that. So one example of uh, stoichiometric, catalytic, and aerobic, uh, I choose that reaction, which is pretty much benchmark reaction, that uh, spiral cyclization. Uh, here, uh, the nitrogen cyclizes here and get the, the quinone here. Uh, this was first described by Kikugawa with 1.3 equivalent of the this uh, trifluoroacetoxyiodobenzene. Uh, so that's the stoichiometric version. Uh, Kita uh, then did the uh, catalytic version uh, first with 10 mole percent of the tolyl um, iodine, uh, and then later on with this uh, bis um, iodoaryl uh, catalyst, which uh, enables low catalytic yielding. And here you have the 1.5 equivalent of MCPBA. What was uh, very recently described by Professor Powers, but he, he would talk more into details, I assume, is how to do it with aerobic catalytic. And the mediator here is uh, acetaldehyde, and it's the auto-oxidation mechanism of acetaldehyde with oxygen uh, that generates the, uh, the species that can oxidize the iodine. And so this was in 2018, and in the, around the same time, also uh, the groups of uh, Ushiyama and Miyamoto described a similar, slightly different system, but based on the same idea. Our idea, uh, I must say, predates that, but it was a bit crazy uh, in the sense that we, we thought that maybe we could use a catalytic uh, relay, and we thought of photocatalysis. Uh, and we thought that we could get a photocatalyst to oxidize uh, the aryl iodine uh, to trigger the, the uh, iodoarine catalysis. Uh, 
Uh, why is it crazy? Because what's been known since almost 10 years now is that this works very well the other way around, which is iodoarine reduction generally to, to generate radicals and the active uh, substrate uh, first uh, by uh, LALVE and here's a review from 2016. Even worse than that, uh, the group of uh, Graham and also Professor Kido in Bordeaux uh, show that you don't even need a photocatalyst, just blue lights can uh, trigger this type of reactions. But uh, without, if you have a suitable photocatalyst to get something exciting, um, oxidative enough, uh, maybe you could get to that uh, radical cation species and oxygen would help uh, closing the photocatalytic system, generating superoxide, and these could recombine in a way that would give uh, hypervalent iodine three species. Uh, one thing is to oxidize the iodoarine, you need uh, something quite strong, and that basically precludes any um, metal-based photocatalyst leaving only acridinium and pyrillium. On the iodine part, you get more options, you can tune uh, the redox properties with the R group. You can have an auto group uh, to favor the formation of a uh, dense iodoxol, or even with the diiodo compound getting the new uh, oxo compound. And so we wanted to screen again conditions. Uh, and what uh, was really the, the big uh, breakthrough was giving the uh, uh, auto uh, iodobenzoic acid 20 more percent. And using this pyridium catalyst that was developed by Beeler because uh, it's more stable and more robust than the standard triphenyl pyridium. And with that, we get 58% yield. Uh, using Kitas catalyst, which is known for uh, enabling a low yielding, uh, low uh, catalytic charge of the, the iodoarine, we could uh, go down to 2.5 mole percent of the iodoarine and 2.5 mole percent of the pyridium. Uh, we just have to use uh, twice the amount every 36 hours. But we got 55% here, and with that, we were quite happy. Uh, we had an okay scope, I'd say, uh, which is maybe not the point here. Uh, various groups can be alkyl and uh, benzyl groups can be put on the oxygen here, especially uh, electron poor groups. Alkyl chain is okay, allyl, propargyl works, and acyloxy. Uh, groups also uh, work. Uh, there are several uh, limitations. Uh, electron rich groups uh, lead to degradation. Uh, same thing with uh, fragile groups such as the uh, OH, OTBS, and TBTL. And if you don't have that oxygen, uh, just a phenyl, benzyl, phthalimides, or uh, tosyl, uh, it doesn't work. Control experiments. Uh, it doesn't work without the iodine, without the photocatalyst, without oxygen, without light, uh, barely works with air, uh, doesn't work in the presence of BHC or tempo, and if you use uh, acetic acid and not HFIP, which is really key to the success of the reaction, there's no reaction, which means that the role of HFIP is not only uh, age bonding, but uh, something deeper. So this was the work of uh, Dr. Loïc Haber, uh, and we were able to demonstrate that it works. You can do a dual organophotocatalysis, iodoarine catalysis to do the reaction. We can discuss on the nature of that species because as I say, it works, but there's so much more to explore and that's why we are really excited about it. Uh, this is available as a preprint. Uh, currently, uh, we had a really, really interesting uh, return from the reviewers last week, and I hope we can get that produced by the end of the summer. And I hope it will uh, stem uh, new ideas and new opportunities uh, for synthesis. Uh, to conclude, I'd like to thank all the people that contributed to the work. So you've seen the picture. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Robert Dodd, who's now emeritus and who was the senior researcher when I joined the CNRS at the Institut de Chimie des Substances Naturelles in gif sur yvette uh, I pointed out to the work of uh, Law here and Tanya here, uh, who did a great job on that. And um, Université Paris-Saclay uh, and uh, ICSN and CNRS for the grants for the PhD students, and also CNRS for um, Young Investigator grant for the, the Loïc Haber Fellowship, which allowed us to explore that um, 
uh, aerobic uh, photocatalytic activity. And as Avery said, I just uh, moved to back to Paris. So this is Gilles Gasser group uh, doing more bio-organometallic chemistry. And I'll try to bring some hypervalent chemistry into that. I hope it, it will okay. make something interesting. And thank you for your attention. Sorry if I'm a bit late. Oh, thank you for your, uh, your, your talk, Kevin. Uh, it's quite interesting. Um, especially interested in, in the, the last the the last portion that that uh, uh, oxygen uh, oxygen as the terminal oxidant um, we have a, a few questions here um, on, on zoom and YouTube maybe we can pick a, a couple um, uh, should I answer like so the first one was the rationality of choosing uh, molecular sieves as an additive uh, we tried several additives. Uh, molecular sieves is usually just to get rid of water. Uh, we realized when we had acetoxy, trifluoroacetoxy, uh, magnesium oxide uh, dries and uh, buffers maybe the reaction. Uh, this goes back to uh, Professor Dodd and uh, Justine Dubois chemistry of amino iodines, uh, where they would generate amino iodines in situ and they would add uh, additives to dry and buffer the reaction. Uh, radical mechanistic pathway during bromocyclization do saturated alkyl chain also react yielding Hoffman loeffler freitag reactions? We don't know yet. As I said, there's so much more to explore in these uh, reactions. Uh, metal containing photocatalyst, I think we tried a couple, but it just didn't work. Uh, HFIP being expensive, yeah, so protic solvents, we tried the um, uh, acetic acid and it doesn't work. So HFIP has more than just uh, bringing protic solvents. And I think it does really help stabilizing the intermediates. Uh, there are probably radical cations and radical species that are involved. Uh, we applied for a grant for which we have a very good um, uh, theoreticians that we hope will help us to understand the role of HFIP, the nature of the intermediates and the stabilization. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of, to dig there. Uh, BR benzyodoxol, there's a question about that. So it works, but our idea was to generate the compound, the bromination species in situ, because these uh, bromo benzyodoxol, you have to make them and we are lazy. So if you can just steer two commercially available uh, compounds, especially uh, diacetoxy iodobenzene, which is widely available and just some uh, bromide salts. The best would be sodium bromide, but uh, same thing about magnesium oxide. Uh, it's a drying agent. And I think it also buffers in the sense that it prevents unwanted side reactions with the uh, uh, acetic or trifluoroacetic acid that you might uh, generate. Um, it usually works without, but not as well. There's one. Uh, there's one question from uh, YouTube as well. Um, they asked in, in slide number nineteen when you use phenol-related substances, did you observe any oxidation of the phenol moiety? Uh, not really. You can, can you see it here? We got mostly, okay, we could not see it, but we have like 70% uh, mass balance back. So that's definitely not the main pathway, but it's also something that might occur. One thing also is uh, a bromination of the uh, electron rich aerial ring, typically the phenol ring. That's also one side product that we observed. Right. Um, I have a couple questions. <laughs> um, one for on slide 20, um, there's the two alkenes, but so I guess- yeah, in, in terpenes, the, the last one uh, is always, it, it's, mm, it's always the first one that reacts. It's slightly more electron rich. Um, if, you, if you add, a, a, four equivalents of lithium bromide and two equivalents of uh, diacetoxy iodobenzene and you leave it for long enough, you would have the tetrabrominated product. 
right okay but if you control the conditions it's the the last one that reacts first and then on slide 52 um why not the electron rich ones uh why did the or i guess the yeah uh, i think in that case the, the pmb reacts with it. we got pretty harsh oxidative conditions because we have pyridium uh, excited states uh we get presumably uh, the activated uh, iodine species. Um, the mechanism of this transformation is not clear because you could activate the anisyl or the nitrogen. Uh, I showed you that uh, activation of the nitrogen with the uh, uh, oxy, uh, the N-oxy uh, bond can take place quite easily. Uh, both mechanism could be operative. Uh, both mechanisms could be competitive, but I think in the case of the PMB, it's probably the PMB reacts and then everything goes down to ashes. Sure. Okay, interesting. Okay, we need one last question on, uh, I guess I'll read it out for, for anybody on YouTube. Uh, in slide 39, why didn't you consider uh, cycloiodonium intermediate um, from I3 and alkene, followed by ring opening via amide oxygen and nucleophilic displacement by bromine. That was a bit of a mouth, mouthful there, but if you refer back to the... Uh, it's, uh, for the mechanism, so which part? Can you... Yeah, I, I agree. Why didn't, why didn't you consider cycloiodonium intermediate from um, I... Three and alkene followed by ring opening. So it's something that is uh, possible. It's been described. Uh, usually, you need a Lewis acid to have a more activated iodine species to react with double bonds. Um, well, it would eventually lead to the same species, <laughs> the same product in the end. So it's hard to discriminate, but. Uh, uh, at least for the um, root A, I think the hypobromite is the more uh, reasonable hypothesis. Uh, for this reaction here, you can discuss, but we assume that if you activate the double bond, then you get the O cyclization, and this is not what we observe. Right. Okay. Well, uh, thank you again. Uh, uh, that's all the questions for now. I think we'll. Uh switch over to the, the uh, other professor, Professor Powers. I mean, thank you again, uh, nice uh, uh, Karyu, for the nice presentation. Uh, thank you for attending our, our, our webinar. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, for our, our second speaker, we have uh, Professor Powers. Um, I'll just introduce him quickly and then uh, you can already see his slides. Um, so uh, Professor Powers was born in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, and he pursued an undergraduate education at Franklin and Marshall College. Um, he then went on to earn his PhD from Harvard University with Professor Tobias Ritter, and he studied bimetallic um, palladium intermediates in CH functionalization. He then went on to pursue his postdoctoral studies with uh, Professor Daniel Nocera, which um, at, at both, or I guess at both MIT and Harvard, I guess he had his move right in the middle there. Um, and then um, he went on to join Texas A&M faculty in uh, 2015. Um, and he studies or is currently working on um, the interface of organic and inorganic chemistry um, and, and developing his research program. Um, he has been recognized by uh, the NSF career, DOE early career and NIH MIRA awards, uh, as well as the Sloan Fellowship in, in the current year. Um, thank you for uh, presenting at, at our, our, our symposium here. I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome, thank you, Avery. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, good. okay. great. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to, um, to share some of our work. Um, I really appreciate Avery and, and Fabio and, and Graham's entire group, I guess, for putting on these, uh, these awesome symposia. It's a nice, uh, breath of, uh, of fresh chemistry uh, in an otherwise sort of dismal summer of, of, of staying in hot Texas. Um, but in any case, I hope that I, uh, I don't disappoint after that beautiful lecture uh, by Kevin. 
Uh, I'm going to share some work that my group uh, has been working on, let's say, over the last three years or so um, towards uh, sustainable hypervalent iodine catalysis um, is, is maybe the theme of the, of, the, of the work that I'll share with you today. Um, so, you know, sort of generally, uh, my group has been excited or um, motivated by uh, the scheme drawn here. Um, so this is uh, the business end of a P450 enzyme. Essentially, this is the cellular machinery that takes uh, I can make a laser pointer really quick, sorry. Uh, this is the cellular machinery that takes uh, simple hydrocarbons uh, and combines those with oxygen gas as the terminal oxidant, uh, transits these reactive metal ligand multiply bonded intermediates, which are uh, the strong metal centered oxidants that cleave that CH bond and ultimately deliver uh, the functionalized fine chemical products out the other side. Uh, and, and we're certainly not alone uh, in being motivated by these sorts of schemes. Uh, if one could translate this biological chemistry uh, to the synthetic uh, regime, uh, one could really impact the synthesis of fine chemicals at all levels of complexity um, from uh, simple things like methane oxidation to generate chemical fuels, uh, to the uh, you know, identification and synthesis of new pharmacological agents uh, by for instance, the site specific hydroxylation of, of pharmacophores. Uh, and in any case, um, as, as likely all of you know, um, that's not possible at present to achieve this sort of chemical transformation in a general way. Um, and I'd say that, you know, the challenges that prevent synthetic chemistry from achieving that at present um, are at least, um, at least some of those challenges are the things that have motivated my group. And uh, the topic of the talk today um, will really center on, on how one efficiently utilizes O2 um, as the terminal oxidant, uh, we'll get into that in, in a little bit more detail as we go. Um, but just a little teaser of the other things my group works on. Uh, we're really interested in trying to understand how one uh, controls the group transfer chemistry from these sort of reactive intermediates in an intermolecular fashion um, that it would be needed to achieve a sort of general synthetic platform for hydrocarbon functionalization. Um, related to that problem, one needs to think about how you control the extent of oxidation. That is, once you start oxidizing hydrocarbons, typically uh, the CH bonds get weaker, uh, which ends up with this sort of thermodynamic waterfall that gets, gets you to CO2, which is a, a sort of pointless uh, endpoint from a synthetic chemist's point of view. Uh, and finally, I have a big program uh, in my group, probably about half of our activities uh, are in trying to do crystallography on reactive intermediates. Um, but those are, those are not really the topics of our conversation today. Uh, I wanna focus on, on the utilization of O2 um, in schemes like this, how do you generate strong oxidants uh, from O2 and, um, and really what are the challenges to achieving that? And I'd say that uh, the challenges uh, are at least superficially quite simple, which is that O2 is a ground state triplet. So you have these two unpaired spins uh, in a pi symmetry orbital uh, and those uh, are uncoupled. So if you do redox chemistry using O2, you typically get one electron events uh, and that gives rise to radical chain uh, sorts of reactions. The other problem uh, which we which we heard a, a bit about earlier is that O2 is a four electron oxidant. So the you know the initial product of a two electron transfer is peroxide. And you have to deal with somehow the fact that you have these four electrons that are that are built into the oxygen system, mostly that you have a pi bond and a sigma bond that one needs to cleave in order to access water, which is the redox couple that's the most attractive. Um, okay, so we're obviously not the first people that thought O2 and synthesis is a good idea. This is a longstanding challenge. Uh, in my opinion, and, you know, maybe I'd say the most general platform for O2 utilization, and also, um, in honesty, one of the places uh, where my own training in organometallic chemistry sort of localized me when we began this work was in the in the palladium oxidase literature. So this chemistry uh, basically is predicated on the fact that palladium two is a really useful intermediate in synthetic chemistry uh, for substrate oxidation chemistry. And, and the simple conjecture was that if one could reoxidize palladium zero using O2 as the terminal oxidant, then you could access palladium two. And then all the chemistry that's typical of palladium two could then be achieved under the action of oxygen as your terminal oxidant. Uh, and there's a huge amount of literature that comes out of this concept. Uh, the historical origins are in the Bakker oxidation, but lots of coworkers, uh, you know, lots of investigators around the world have looked at this over time. Um, you know, for our perspective, we are interested in how actually this oxygen chemistry works. Uh, and at least in the palladium literature, there's, basically, there's, there's sort of two ideas. Uh, one is that you could have direct oxidation, either via side-on peroxides or via bis, uh, superoxide adducts that would take palladium zero back to palladium two. 
The challenge here is that the ligands that will promote this direct oxidation of palladium zero with O2 are fairly limiting. And that makes sense because palladium, palladium zero, I'm sorry, is D10, it's closed shell. The same singlet triplet issues that impede O2 reacting with organic molecules typically uh, rear their ugly head when one considers palladium zero oxidation. Uh, so much more, much more typically, one does not use oxygen directly with palladium Instead, you use what's called an electron transfer mediator, which uh, Professor Carey uh, beautifully introduced before. In this idea, you basically take a molecule that spontaneously reacts with O2. So for instance, here I show hydroquinone. That spontaneously auto-oxidizes in the presence of O2 to generate quinone. And then quinone for the oxidation of palladium zero to palladium two. Okay. So if we just go back to the scheme I introduced at the beginning, which is these sort of you know uh, metal cofactors of biology, to generate metal ligand multiply bonded intermediates. The simple fact is that the electron transfer mediators that are largely available uh, and have been utilized in palladium chemistry are not oxidizing enough to achieve this transformation. Further, they don't really participate in the sort of group transfer modality uh, that one needs essentially to transfer oxidatively uh, the oxygen atom uh, that's illustrated here. So, you know, obviously this audience uh, needs no explanation. What did synthetic chemists do? They invented hypervalent iodine compounds, or at least they leveraged available hypervalent iodine compounds for this oxidation. Uh, and this is obviously driven by the exceptional leaving group ability of iodobenzene, where this iodosyl benzene functions as essentially a two electron surrogate of the oxygen atom that you would like to, but cannot access out of, out of O2. Okay, so when my group got started, we thought it would be nice if you could make hypervalent iodine compounds from O2. Uh, and then essentially, you could, uh, just to go back a second, you could generate these species uh, from oxygen and then all the chemistry uh, that's available to these compounds, which are substantially stronger oxidants than palladium two, uh, would then be accessible to the synthetic chemist. Uh, and and our, at least our initial uh, foray into this chemistry was predicated on aldehyde auto-oxidation uh, this is a, an ancient reaction which uh, initiates by uh, exposure of an aldehyde to O2, which uh, generates an acyl radical. That acyl radical then traps O2 at diffusionally limited rates to generate a peroxy radical. This peroxy radical then sets up a radical chain mechanism by reaching back, pulling off an H atom from aldehyde to generate another equivalent of acyl radical and to generate a per acid. These per acids under normal conditions have a uh, downstream chemistry via Bayer-Villiger reaction, first via this peroxide, uh, which subsequently uh, fragments to ultimately deliver you carboxylic acid. And when we thought about this scheme, uh, what we recognized was that essentially what you've done is you've taken a four electron triplet oxidant in O2, and you've generated a two electron singlet oxidant in per acid. So our initial hypothesis was that if one could divert that intermediate by intercepting that with iodobenzene, one could then take an oxygen atom directly from O2, pass that to the iodoarene to generate the iodosyl benzene. And I think one of the things which excited us, and I'm sure excites many of those listening, was the possibility that not only would that gain us access to oxygen atom transfer, but also via the well-described ligand exchange chemistry at the hypervalent iodine center would generate sort of generic X atom transfer reagents, which may represent a general platform for aerobic oxidation and not a specific platform for hydroxylation. Um, so this works basically, as I described, this is fairly old chemistry now, so I won't, I won't belabor the point, but essentially, you know, we take O2, we take acetaldehyde. In all this chemistry um, that I'll show you here, we use uh, one mole percent of cobalt two. That's not a catalyst, it's an initiator. Um, basically, uh, to get the aldehyde auto oxidation to go reproducibly, one needs to uh, generate a little bit of a cobalt superoxide intermediate, at least that's our hypothesis, and that kicks off the, 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 the chain reaction. Uh, and basically any iodoarene that we've exposed to these conditions uh, participates in the chemistry of it, as I've described. Uh, in my opinion, this is a pretty convenient way of making these molecules uh, because all the byproducts are volatile. Uh, often you don't really care if there's one mole percent of cobalt three around. Uh, if you do, you can get it out in an aqueous wash. Um, so the point of this, uh, this chemistry, um, from my perspective, uh, at the beginning at least, was that it was not to make reagents, but was to, uh, was to explore the catalytic application of O2. Uh, so these are not, um, are not complex synthetic transformations that I'll show you, but I think highlight uh, conceptually why it is that we thought that the hypervalent iodine chemistry was attractive uh, to do O2 chemistry. So here's just a series of things that you're probably familiar with. This is the alpha Oxy, uh, oxygenation of beta ketoesters. Uh, in this case, 
Obviously, the tosylate group comes from tosic acid. If you replace that uh, with tetrabutyl ammonium bromide, instead of aerobic oxygenation chemistry, now we see aerobic bromination chemistry, which uh, speaks to this ligand exchange uh, proclivity at the hypervalent center. Uh, a couple of reactions, which I think are probably synthetically more interesting. Here's the example um, that we just heard about in the last talk, which is the oxidative de-aromatization of a phenol derivative to construct this CN bond uh, in a lactam. Uh, this is promoted with a catalytic amount of iodoarene. Uh, this is probably my favorite example, which is an intermolecular NHCH cross-coupling. Uh, again, catalytic and iodoarene. Uh, and in this case, the only stoichiometric byproduct is, uh, is acetic acid. Um, and just to, um, you know, historical accuracy, uh, this chemistry was developed uh, essentially simultaneously with a, a very similar paper that came out of, uh, that, that was written by Miyamoto, uh, in which case they showed diol cleavage reactions uh, and oxidative Hoffman rearrangements uh, promoted under the same kind of aldehyde promoted aerobic oxidation uh, sorts of conditions. Um, okay, so um, you know just to just to give a little bit of a sense, most of what I'll share uh, the meat of the talk will be will be mechanistic, but just to give a sense a little bit of the synthetic applications, uh, everything I've shown you so far is out of the iodine three or iodosyl benzene ox, uh, oxidation state. Um, obviously, there's a complementary set of reactions that are available from iodyl benzenes. Uh, these reagents are much more typically encountered um, in uh, sort of dehydrogenation reactions, I would say, alcohol oxidations, amine oxidations, these sorts of things. Um, and, you know, we thought, you know, sort of classically, the way that these reagents are made is a serial oxidation, I1 to I3, and then subsequently oxidizing to I5. Uh, but I think it is broadly recognized um, that iodine three is the strongest oxidant in this family. Uh, another way of saying that is that iodine three is metastable with respect to disproportionation to make iodine one and iodine five. Uh, and we wondered if we could identify an appropriate substrate such that this uh, disproportionation would be spontaneous. Um, so there's a number of examples. Uh, Professor Zdankin um, notably reported a ruthenium catalyzed disproportionation. Uh, we were wondering if we could find one that was that, that essentially required no catalyst. Uh, under the conditions that we have been working under, these aldehyde promoted oxidations, um, we found that this iodyl benzene, which is derived from the um, terbutyl sulfone uh, developed by uh, Professor Protasevich uh, as a soluble iodosyl benzene, this reagent is spontaneously generated when you take the corresponding iodobenzene benzene and expose it to our uh, oxidation conditions. Uh, and with that iodyl benzene in hand, uh, we were able to extend some of what we've, I've shown you before um, to a family of alcohol oxidation reactions. Uh, I would say these are certainly not uh, kind of best in class uh, alcohol oxidation protocol, but, but more demonstration of a concept uh, that one can do uh, iodyl benzene catalysis um, if you have identified ways to, to render that disproportionation chemistry uh, very facile. Okay, so like I said, most of what I want to share with you are, are some um, some uh, more recent work uh, in, in studying and applying uh, the mechanism of these reactions. So I'll just go back to the scheme I showed uh, initially about, um, shoot, I'm, uh, okay, I was just having a hard time with my laser pointer, um, about the aldehyde odd oxidation reactions. So this is the scheme that I showed you, uh, the various intermediates that are generated. Um, this is certainly a simplification of what's actually present in a reaction pot uh, like those that we've been talking about. Uh, so, for instance, cobalt-3 is the obligate byproduct of this uh, cobalt-2 promoted odd oxidation step. Uh, and cobalt-3, under certain circumstances, can promote the oxidation of per acids actually back to peroxy radicals with the concurrent reduction of cobalt-3 back to cobalt-2. So there's this sort of redox cycling going on. Uh, this chemistry's, I shouldn't say this, this is a joke I usually tell when I'm not talking to my own students, if you are on the call, but uh, this chemistry is done in Texas and not in a glove box, so there's certainly quite a bit of water around, uh, and that water undoubtedly sets up the equilibrium drawn here where you're generating some hydrogen peroxide. Um, further, uh, the peroxy radicals um, are known to participate in the transformation called the Russell termination. That's where two uh, peroxy radicals approach one another, dimerize with the evolution of half an equivalent of singlet oxygen uh, and the coevolution of acetoxy radical. Uh, and then these acetoxy radicals can decarboxylate, uh, acyl radicals can decarbonylate, that would generate alkyl radicals, CO or CO2. I present all of this just to, to show you the, the, the complexity 
of intermediates that may be involved in the chemistry and at least what we were thinking about when we uh, contemplated what might be going on in our reactions. Uh, so the first task we set about was trying to identify what intermediates uh, actually were present in the reaction. Uh, so if you just monitor the oxidation of iodobenzene to iodobenzene diacetate, what you see is the consumption of starting material. I'm sorry, uh, as you go ahead in time, the evolution of product here highlighted in pink. Uh, but what you notice is the, um, the intermediate evolution and then consumption of a, of a quartet down here around five and a half. That quartet is uh, assigned as the methine resonance of this compound E, this peroxide. So this compound is certainly present uh, in a magnetization transfer experiment uh, which is basically an intermolecular NOE, uh, what we can see is that these molecules here are in equilibrium so that we, we know that we have peracetic acid also. If you plot just the mole fraction as a function of time, what you see is the consumption of starting material, the disappearance, I mean, the, the, the evolution of product concurrent with the disappearance of starting material. And honestly, when we initially uh, did this work, we saw this evolution of intermediate and then consumption. Uh, these traces are uh, classical sort of sigmoidal kinetics that one would have if you have uh, pairwise reactions where the first one is, uh, is slower than the, I mean, the, the first one is faster than the second. So you build up an intermediate and then that intermediate is consumed. And, and based on this, uh, we proposed um, much like, you know, much of the, uh, the synthetic literature of hypervalent iodine has demonstrated that per acetic acid or this peroxide were really the oxidant under these conditions. Um, a number of observations, I'll, I'll, I'll explain a few of them, led us to reconsider that, uh, that position. Um, so just to continue briefly with, with other experiments to, to look at what intermediates are present, uh, we also did an EPR experiment to try to look for uh, these open shell intermediates. Uh, and in this experiment, what we do is we add a radical trap. This is a reagent that reacts with transient radicals to generate persistent radicals, which can be interrogated by EPR spectroscopy simply. Uh, and what this data here shows, this is the experimental work here, is that uh, essentially we see uh, the signature of this acetoxy radical being trapped by this spin trap that we're using, uh, this nitrone. The observation of an acetoxy radical, I would argue, implies the intermediacy of a peroxy radical, um, which is that why we highlight that in green. Uh, and then if you do some headspace analysis, just sample the gas above the reaction, you see some CO2, uh, which demonstrates that this decarboxylation uh, is at least operative on the time scale of the synthetic chemistry that we're doing. Okay, but the observation that these five green species uh, are present during our, in our reaction mixture really says nothing about their kinetic competence. Um, and, and that's um, sort of the point I was trying to get to um, in that obviously we all know that peracetic acid can oxidize iodobenzene. The question is just, does it do it under our reaction conditions? Um, I would say the reaction, uh, the result that made me um, kind of consider the possibility that peracetic acid is not ultimately the primary oxidant um, is shown here. So if you take cyclohexane and you expose that to the oxidation conditions we've been discussing, acetaldehyde and O2, uh, you see the partial conversion of cyclohexane to cyclohexanone. And if you measure the kinetic isotope effect for that reaction by using a mixture of H12 and D12 cyclohexane, what you see is a large primary kinetic isotope effect. And if you look in the literature, that KIE basically uh, is diagnostic for H atom abstraction by an oxygen centered radical. Um, if you then take this same reaction mixture, and now we're just gonna add iodobenzene, what we see is that we completely suppress the oxidation of the CH bond and we divert that towards the oxidation of the aryl iodide. And I think what that demonstrates pretty strongly is that iodobenzene is a kinetic inhibitor of whatever the process was that was giving us cyclohexanone. Uh, another way of saying that is iodobenzene is interacting with the same radical oxidant that was abstracting the CH bond and is ultimately productively giving us hypervalent iodine intermediate. Okay. Uh, the other piece of data, which I think pretty much puts the nail in the coffin of, uh, of a per acetic acid based oxidation is that if you just look at the linear free energy relationship for the rate of variously substituted iodobenzenes with per acetic acid, what you see is uh, these data are well correlated uh, with Hammett sigma values that one might expect. Um, if you then go and you look at the same linear free energy relationship, but instead of using per acetic acid, we use our aldehyde promoted conditions. Uh, what you see is that the, the data are again, well correlated, uh, but no longer with Hammett sigma values, but instead with these Hammett sigma plus values. Uh, and the sigma plus values are a, um, 
basically an analogous set of values, but they were trained on different reactions. Uh, there's a number of examples where these uh, particular sigma plus values have been shown uh, to be well correlated with the rates of benzylic oxidation, which would sort of look like a one electron oxidation of an iodobenzene. Uh, and, and more notably, the slopes here are, are vastly different. This slope is about minus two and this slope is about a half, which indicates that the rate determining step in these two sets of transformations is not the same. Um, okay. Uh, so with this data, we collaborated with Osvaldo Gutierrez uh, and, his, and his outstanding student, Mingbin, um, at the University of Maryland. Uh, the mechanism that, that came out of these calculations uh, is depicted here. Essentially, iodobenzene interacts with aerobically generated acetoxy radical. This is reversibly to generate a transient iodinyl radical or an iodine-2 species. And that iodine-2 species is engaged with, uh, a, in this case, I show per acetic acid, which would generate ultimately iodine-3 and extrude a molecule of uh, or a, a, an, another equivalent of acetoxy radical, which will set up a radical chain. I'll show the chain in a moment. Just as a point of comparison, um, the direct reaction with per acetic acid is certainly available and has a reasonable uh, transition state energy. Uh, we view this as essentially a Curtin-Hammett condition, where iodobenzene and this iodinyl radical are rapidly exchanging, and really the uh, selection between these two pathways is dictated by the energy difference of the transition states for oxidation of either iodine-1 or iodine-2. Um, okay, to summarize what I just said, uh, here's the chain reaction um, that, that we arrived at. Uh, so you have initiation, like I showed before, to generate peroxy radicals. This is, a, this is just the classic reactions of odd oxidation. Uh, you then have Russell termination to generate singlet oxygen and acetoxy radicals which as I said, reversibly add to iodobenzene to generate iodinyl species. And those iodine-2 intermediates are then critical chain carriers, which ultimately generate hypervalent iodine species and the propagating acetoxy radical. A variety of termination pathways are available, either addition of that acetoxy radical to the iodine-2 or disproportionation of this iodine-2 is strongly exothermic. Um, so I got to say, we were pretty excited when we when we formulated this this scheme for ourselves. Um, it was probably a reflection of our lack of uh, appreciation for main group auto oxidation literature, um, in that uh, very similar pathways have pr been pr proposed uh, for phos phosphine auto oxidation. That is, uh, the phosphorus three uh, going through phosphonyl radicals or these phosphorus four species en route to phosphine oxides. Uh, similar chemistry has been proposed. Um, in the auto oxidation of late metal alkyl and, and hydride complex. This is an example from Karen Goldberg's lab, uh, where essentially oxygen centered radicals add to palladium two to generate palladium three intermediates, which then propagate these radical chains. Um, I'd say, you know, from a fundamental perspective, it's probably not that surprising the iodine chemistry goes through mechanisms like this because similar to phosphorus and palladium, iodine has the ability to expand its valence, obviously, which is why we're all sitting in a hypervalent iodine symposium. Um, in any case, I just wanted to um, draw a, a bit of a connection, if I might, um, between this mechanism uh, and the chemistry that we just saw. Um, we were pretty excited when we saw this preprint uh, because I think it's another beautiful example where the one electron chemistry of aryl iodides generates uh, these iodinyl radicals, and that is a productive step, not a, not a destructive step, which, um, as, we, as we heard, is much more often the case going hypervalent iodine photon to generate iodine-2 species, which subsequently react downstream. Okay, but back to the, the, the sort of chemistry that I want to share with you. Everything that we've talked about so far um, is, is basically using aldehyde auto oxidation as the front-end machinery simply to generate acetoxy radical. And based on our proposed mechanism, that acetoxy radical engages with iodoarine to generate the hypervalent iodine intermediates that we're utilizing in synthesis. And we were wondering if it wasn't possible to access this species uh, in a complementary way, which would maybe expand the substrate tolerance of the chemistry that we've been talking about. Uh, and you know, one of the things that we initially or immediately came to was, you know, could you take uh, acetate and just pull an electron off of it? So this would look like the first step uh, in a Colby electrolysis, which is one of the earliest synthetic uh, electrocatalytic reactions uh, that organic chemists know. And uh, we thought that that might gain entry again to these uh, acetate stabilized iodinyl radicals, which may be able to uh, be leveraged for the chemistry that we're interested in. Um, 
obviously we're not the first uh, to be interested in doing uh, hypervalent iodine electrochemistry either. Uh, there's some very uh, classic work uh, showing that if you just electrolyze uh, iodobenzenes, you can generate I3 and I5 species. Uh, more recently, uh, the use of these fluorinated solvents has become very popular to generate what are uh, chemically competent but fairly unstable uh, alkoxy uh, adducts of the hypervalent iodine center. Um, there's been an incredible amount of work of trying to apply those electrochemically generated hypervalent iodine uh, compounds to substrate functionalization. But uh, the point that I would like to make is that um, the inherent challenge in doing uh, any hypervalent iodine catalysis, obviously, how do you oxidize the iodine center in preference to the substrate that you're ultimately trying to oxidize? And that is really um, a diabolical challenge, uh, which has often led to what's called X-cell application of iodoarine. So in this case, uh, you see the electrochemical generation of fluorinated hypervalent iodine compounds, and then the subsequent treatment of, uh, of substrate with those species in a separate reaction step. Uh, and that's obviously extremely important chemistry to teaching us how to make these compounds, but it does not fundamentally address the challenge of how does one uh, deal with this competitive oxidation of substrate and iodine. Um, uh, Professor uh, Wirth has demonstrated a complementary, very beautiful strategy using flow chemistry, which essentially just spatially dislocates the electrochemistry and the substrate functionalization. Um, and there are a number of examples, a, a limited number, but a number of examples of electrocatalysis. So this is um, you know, a, a classic example of doing uh, CH fluorination. I would point out that um, the strategy here um, at least I, I, I hypothesize that this is productive because it's such an electron deficient substrate, uh, which enables the, uh, the iodine centered electrochemistry to proceed in preference uh, to the substrate uh, derived chemistry. Okay, so just to remind you what we're hoping to do is to generate uh, ligand stabilized iodine two species electrochemically and then use that as a technique to try to do electrocatalysis. So our, um, our first entry into this chemistry was the following uh, experiment. We were looking at the intramolecular CN bond forming reaction to generate carbazoles, which is also a classic reaction in hypervalent iodine chemistry. Uh, and what we found is that if you just take, uh, you know, a variety of aryl iodides and a non-coordinating counter ion like tetrabutyl ammonium PF6, uh, what you find is that you have absolutely no uh, CN bond forming chemistry uh, that we could observe under a variety of conditions. Uh, but what we did find is that if you take that electrolyte mixture, which is, like I said, tetrabutyl ammonium PF6, and we dope in one equivalent of acetate, we uh, immediately turn on the productive chemistry to generate the CN bond. That chemistry requires the aryl iodide, which suggests that really this acetate participation in a redox cycle, we'll get to the details of that in a second, um, is really critical to get that chemistry to go. Um, so just to show that that's not a one-off, um, Again, I would say this is probably not the point of the work, but um, there is some substrate generality. In every case here, if you leave the acetate out, there's very, uh, there's very little uh, chemistry that proceeds. In fact, only you know, a couple of substrates have a background reaction uh, in the absence of aryl iodide also. But if, if there's no uh, uncatalyzed pathway, acetate is an obligate component of the reaction mixture. Uh, similarly, you can do this chemistry in an intermolecular fashion using these uh, hydrazine derivatives uh, there's again some substrate scope to this, and, and like I said, in the intramolecular sense, uh, in each case, um, there's a, a dichotomous uh, outcome depending on whether acetate is present or not present. Okay, so uh, really what we were interested in is trying to understand if we could use this as a platform to start to learn about hypervalent iodine electrochemistry uh, in a more systematic way uh, to teach us how to uh, deal with this, um, this, uh, this competitive oxidation problem. Um, so I unfortunately don't have a solution to all of that, but I'll, I'll share with you at least the progress we've made, um, which is, um, you know, largely we considered two mechanisms for the electrochemical reaction that we've been discussing. In one reaction, you might imagine an interfacial electron transfer to pull an electron off of iodine to generate this iodine-2 cation, which would then be trapped by acetate and stabilized as this acetate uh, stabilized iodinyl radical we've encountered before. And then subsequently that would go on to do the chemistry to generate hypervalent iodine species. Uh, alternately, one could imagine that initially you oxidize acetate to an acetoxy radical. This would look directly analogous to what we were talking about before. And like I said, this would be the first step in a Colby electrolysis 
uh, which would then act, it would just add to iodobenzene and ultimately give product. So just a few experimental observations. Uh, so this is the electrochemical background if we just take the tetrabutyl ammonium PF6 in our solvent. Uh, this is when you, when you electrolyze acetate in acetonitrile. Uh, you see a, 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 an enormous onset potential for acetate oxidation. Uh, if you take a headspace analysis of that, uh, of that electrolysis, what you see is the evolution of ethane, CO2, and methane. These are the products that one gets if you ac access acetoxy radicals. That is, you have decarboxylation to generate CO2, and the resulting methyl radical either abstracts a CH bond to generate methane or dimerizes to generate ethane. Uh, importantly, acetonitrile is an unproductive solvent for us uh, to do electrocatalysis. It's only when we go to HFIP uh, that we get electrochemistry to turn on. And what you see is that if you electrolyze uh, uh, acetate in HFIP, you see a substantial increase in the onset potential. We attribute that to strong hydrogen bonding between the HFIP uh, OH and the acetate uh, anion. And importantly, if you electrolyze again at one and a half volts, which is where we're going to be um, electrolyzing in our catalysis, you see absolutely none of the products that you'd expect for Colby electrolysis, which really suggests that this initial electrochemical event is not operative when you're in, uh, when you're in hexafluoroisopropanol solvent. Okay, just one more uh, bit of data. If you just look at the, uh, the catalyst we've been using is 4 iodoanisol. Uh, if you look at the scan rate dependence of its electrochemistry, what you see is at low scan rate, you have sort of poor reversibility. There's a little bit of funniness in this oxidation wave, which we don't 100% understand. Uh, but as you increase the scan rate, what you see is enhanced reversibility, um, electrochemical reversibility, that is. If you plot the peak potential as a function of scan rate, uh, what you find is that uh, you get linear, you, you have a linear plot if you, you, you plot the, the square root of the scan rate. I, I'm not an electroanalytical chemist, but th this is apparently diagnostic for essentially an outer sphere uh, electron transfer and not first adsorption of aryl iodide onto the electrode surface and then chemistry at the electrode. Uh, so this really suggests you have chemistry in solution. Uh, and then the important thing, so this is the this is the highest scan rate that we showed a minute ago. Now if you add acetate, you completely suppress the, the reversibility. So you lose this return wave and you see a significant increase in the uh, in the uh, in the current. Uh, the current density, which implies that the acetate is reacting with whatever the electrochemically generated species is to generate some uh, new chemical entity, which is going on. Uh, so with this data, basically, uh, I would just like to exclude this sort of Colby process that we were proposing and instead suggest that this chemistry likely goes through first electron transfer to pull to generate this iodine-2 cation, which is then stabilized by acetate addition, which ultimately goes on. And I think that really, um, is incredibly exciting to us because it suggests that the possibility of controlling the stability and thus reactivity of these intermediates is really intimately dependent on what the ligand is that you're adding and not the ligand center redox chemistry. Uh, and I think that there's a real opportunity here which we're excited to pursue about trying to think about uh, ligand stabilized iodine two species as a handle to sort of more, more rational design of, uh, of hypervalent iodine electrocatalysis. Okay, so just to summarize, I started out by, by describing some of our early work uh, in O2, uh, these aldehyde promoted reactions, uh, which has enabled uh, some uh, sort of aerobic oxidation catalysis via hypervalent iodine intermediates. Um, I then spent a, a reasonable amount of time, I'm sorry uh, for the detail, uh, trying to, uh, to argue that these acetoxy radicals are really the critical intermediates uh, in that aerobic chemistry and that iodine two compounds um, are really uh, the important species towards productive synthesis, the iodine, uh, the iodine three compounds, uh, and then I tried to show that, um, you know, sort of supportive of that mechanistic hypothesis, uh, that that the electrochemical reaction to try to access the same intermediates uh, can be leveraged uh, to do electrocatalytic CN bond forming chemistry. Um, so with that, I'll just thank the people who did this. Ashim uh, was really the the driver of a lot of our early O2 chemistry. Uh, Sung Min was a critical. Uh, a critical uh, designer of the uh, mechanistic experiments that I talked talk to you about. Um, she became obsessed with acetoxy radicals for a while. Uh, Ashima Brandon have really spearheaded our, our electrochemistry. Uh, a number of the other students have worked on projects I didn't get a chance to, to share with you. Um, we're of course grateful for the, the financial support. Uh, and again, I really appreciate the chance to share our work. I'm sorry if I went over time. 
Uh, but in any case, I'd be happy to take questions if there are. Oh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation, Professor Powers. Um, wonderful and interesting, lots to think about. Uh, certainly not something uh, I guess I see every day. Um, not as many questions as uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, I guess the straight synthetic. Uh, that, 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 that either means I did a good job or a horrible job, yeah. <laughs> Um, very interesting, though. Uh, oh, I guess here, here's one. Um, have you made any attempts to generate the I-5 reagents electrochemically? Yeah, we've made a lot of efforts um, in that direction, um, both uh, motivated by what I, what I tried to suggest about this concept of disproportionation. So there is, um, I, I think it was in... Um, I can't remember the journey. There, there's a one. There's a paper, a fairly recent paper about uh, IBX synthesis on boron doped diamond uh, electrodes, um, which very beautifully uh, demonstrates that it's possible. Uh, the challenge there is the potential is really high. So we tried to do uh, the same sort of trick of disproportionating iodine three compounds that are generated electrochemically. Um, we've not had success yet. Um, but it's certainly an area that I think um, has a lot of potential because, um, you know, as, as, as we all know, the, the substrate functionalization chemistry is complementary between those two, um, those two classes of reagents. So I think if we could do that, we could really expand what could be done um, electrochemically. Okay. I, I, have one, I have a question. I don't know if this is really a good question or a question, con whatever it is. Um, have you ever done anything with, I guess, could you generate a peroxide somehow that could break up and then oxidize, like make peroxy, or I guess a peroxide to a radical, or is that kind of defeat the purpose of? Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> we've spent, um, I have been unhealthy amount of time trying to get an EPR spectrum of, a, of an iodine two intermediate. Uh, and, and at least one of the strategies there is to try to take peroxides and, 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 and cleave them uh, to generate the iodine two species. Um, <clears throat> There's a number of peroxides that react. Um, so hydroperoxides can react with iodine three species unproductively. Um, so for instance, hydrogen peroxide itself uh, reacts with, with you know, iodobenzene diacetate to generate iodobenzene and singlet oxygen, um, which is uh, I think an underappreciated um, reaction chemistry. Um, yeah, I mean, I have to say that um, the, the first talk that we heard today, we've thought a lot about trying to do similar sort of photochemistry with peroxides. Um, so we were excited to see that. Um, and, uh, but no, we, we don't have much to, to share about, um, about peroxide cleavage to generate the iodine two compounds. Okay. Um, Dr. Carew actually has, uh, I think his own question, maybe, uh, he can either unmute himself and ask that, uh, you could ask. Yeah, you. Can you hear me? Thanks for the, the very, very interesting talk. Uh, just, a. Can you comment maybe on two points? Is the, the role of the HFIP, which is apparently really important in many cases. And the other thing is the fact that uh, it seems that many of the transformations would go through N-centered radicals, uh, the one that are really operative that you show. If you can comment on that, but uh, yeah. once so, again, really great talk. Really yes. Yeah, those are those are good questions. Um, so the issue with HFIP, um, you know, I don't know. This has sort of um, achieved a, a lore-like status in, in hypervalent iodine chemistry. It seems like uh, it's just the magical solvent. Um, in some of our chemistry, I would say that we have no difference from um, anything else that's that's going on. Um, you know, people propose that HFIP is a strong hydrogen bond donor, and thus. Um, can accentuate the electrophilicity of the iodine center. Um, I think that that's probably true in a lot of the, the just substrate functionalization part. Um, for our electrochemistry, I think the HFIP is likely playing a more specific role, um, which is that uh, what you can see here um, is that when you're in, you know, this is a kind of a general observation. It's not just the cedar nitrile, but uh, in, in a variety of aprotic solvents, Basically, when you oxidize, I'll get my laser pointer back. Um, when you oxidize acetate or, or carboxylates in general, what you see is that those have a pretty strong and pretty low potential onset for oxidation. And, and ultimately, what we found is that's unproductive. Um, that is the direct electron transfer out of acetate. 
Um, so I didn't show this, these experiments. I, I'm, I could dig them out of a supporting information somewhere, but uh, what we found uh, electrochemically is that when you go to HFIP, you shift the onset potential significantly downfield. What we attribute that to is the formation of an adduct between HFIP and acetate, a specific adduct. Um, and, and that's supported by um, basically, uh, you know, continuous variation measurements where you take uh, HFIP and acetate, you mix those uh, in various fractions, uh, and you look at the NMR spectrum. Uh, and what you see is that there's clearly a one-to-one -one adduct gets generated. Um, and I think that that's a reflection of the strong, um, you know, HFIP has basically just the right pKa to strongly hydrogen bond to acetate to suppress the oxidation of acetate uh, sufficiently that we can move basically a, the, the acetate oxidation outside the potential for iodine oxidation. Maybe that's the, the critical part that I, um, that I didn't mention before is that we're moving acetate out past all the electrocatalysis we're doing is at one and a half volts applied potential. Uh, that relates to your other question, which is also a really good one, which is um, what's the deal with N-centered radical chemistry? Um, as, at least in the electrochemistry, what we know is that there's, there's no background reaction in the absence of aryl iodide and acetate for essentially every substrate that's electron neutral or electron deficient. If you really jack up the, I'll just go back to that slide. Um, there it is. Um, if you really load up, um, for instance, this asterisk here, I should have mentioned that that asterisk is there because there is a little bit of a background reaction in this case, which I think is if you go to electron rich substrates, there is the possibility to do direct substrate oxidation. And that's reflected in the electrochemistry of the substrate by itself. If you just take the CV of these substrates, what you see is that substrates that show background also have a low onset potential. Uh, and for the vast majority of these substrates, the, the direct uh, interfacial electron transfer event is at a substantially higher potential than the um, than the catalyst oxidation that we're showing. Thanks. All right, there's a, a couple more on um, on the, the Q and A here. The first one um, asked, "What would be the mechanism in case of cyclic hypervalent iodine reagents?" So, so I guess, for example, from uh, two iodobenzoic acid. How do you explain the formation of the, the OH reagent with, uh, with that reagent? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm always um, a little anxious to talk too much about some of those details because I think that the facility of ligand exchange um, and hydrolysis of the iodoesters is pretty fast. Um, so it's not obvious in every case what the primary product is. Um, my impression um, is that you know, certainly you can change the mechanism by which the iodine oxidizes by changing the electronic demand at iodine. So I think if you, um, if you generate a sufficiently nucleophilic uh, aryl iodide, then obviously you're advantaging direct oxidation with per acid. Um, the details of the, um, you know, the impact on mechanism of various substituents is, is not something we've pursued a ton yet. Um, so I guess that's sort of a non-answer. <laughs> Um, uh, there's one more here that asked, have you ever tried, um, have you ever tried to synthesize in larger scale, uh, the, the reagents with your protocol? Yeah. Um, I think the first time we did the aldehyde chemistry, we had a request to do a bigger scale. And I want to say that we made, um, we isolated about a gram and a half of the, um, uh, iodobenzene diacetate, uh, from one reaction. Um, operationally, it's not um, the most straightforward because uh, acid aldehyde is a little bit volatile. Um, so I think that if you go to big scale, what we found is that um, you needed to have sort of portion wise addition um, of aldehyde because the, um, you know, basically volatilization of your reagent competes with the reaction time that you have. So um, that's a little bit of an issue, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it can scale. Um, there's obviously problems always with O2 chemistry and scaling just with um, gas diffusion through the interface. Um, and we've not spent very much time trying to look for the kind of flow reactors or these sorts of, you know, well-mixed conditions that, um, that would avoid those problems. Okay. Um, and one, one last one from uh, related to electrochemistry again. Uh, 
Do you have any idea why electrochemical reversibility is poor in, in CV recorded in, uh, I guess, tetrabutyl of odium PF6 slash HFIP? Why your electrochemical reversibility? I'm not 100% sure I understand the question. Uh, so, okay, so maybe we're talking about, about these plots. Um, I'm not sure, but... Uh, yeah, so what we found is that the, the reversibility of the iodoanisol oxidation is also pretty, uh, pretty solvent dependent. Um, and I think that makes sense because if you have, um, if you're running a CV and you take an electron out, reversibility requires that that species be stable on the time scale of completing your scan and going back. So if you generate an iodine-2 intermediate in a solvent that doesn't well stabilize that iodine-2 intermediate, um, then you're going to have some decomposition pathway. For instance, you know, you could envision deiodination uh, pathways that might be operative. Um, and I think that that may be, you know, maybe to go back to, to Kevin's question, that may be another reason why HFIP is so useful is that um, it's a reasonably good donor. I mean, if you, you know, you're, you're obviously ultimately going to make the bis- uh, HFIP uh, iodine three species as the electrochemical product. So, you know, that transient iodine two compound has to be stabilized enough to get you reversibility, um, which is why, I mean, just to, to emphasize that point, it's, which is why when you add acetate, you destroy the reversibility because no longer does that species sit here waiting to go backwards. You, you react it with acetate faster than, um, faster than it's going to, you know, b before it has time to be reduced is the, is the point of that experiment. All right. Interesting. All right. I, I, I have one more question that came up in my head. <laughs> Great. Hope you don't mind. Um, have you tried, I guess, I don't know if this would be something that would be possible. Have you tried adding, I guess, one species Like, could you have like an iota benzene with a formal group on it? Um, in some sense that you just have one, iodine that you could just wash out at the end and that has everything on it already? Or is it just, you really do need that? Yeah, now? that's a great idea. Um, and there's been a huge amount of work uh, by Professor Frank on this point, electrochemically at least, which is trying to tether the iodoarine with the, uh, with the electrolyte, um, which, is, which is always a problem, maybe in a little bit of a different context, but basically putting, you know, trialkyl ammonium substituents on your aryl iodide so that you're iodobenzene and your electrolyte are the same species. Um, I think there's a lot of promise there. The problem in our, our um, aldehyde chemistry is that fundamentally the aldehyde is not catalytic. It's, it's stoichiometrically consumed. So, right. you know, if you want to turn over your iodobenzene, you don't want to put a, a part on there that's going to irreversibly change. Um, but yeah, we've certainly been looking at some of the, um, at some of the charged iodoarenes in the context of, uh, of electrocatalysis. All right, all right. Thank you. Well, I guess that is, uh, seems to be all the questions. Um, I guess I'd like to thank uh, both Dr. Uh, Carew, um and Professor uh, Powers for, for their wonderful talks and, and for all the audience for, for joining us today in our, our little virtual symposium. Um, it was nice to be able to have a second one and uh, hopefully we can have a, a few more in the, in the future as well. Um, yeah, keep it going into the, the fall term. Um, and please keep your eyes out for those. Uh, hopefully we can promote them the same way um, and have, have uh, lots of audience members join once again. Um, Graham, are you still around? I don't know if you want to say a few words. I am still around. Um, no, just thank you everybody for joining. This was a great success. I liked both the talks. It was wonderful. Uh, and mostly just thank you to Avery and Fabio for putting these together. It's wonderful to have grad students who are willing to take this initiative and do this. So congratulations, you two. Thank you. I just wanted to also add uh, my thank you to uh, Professor Powers and, and uh, Dr. Cario for making these possible. It's also made me realize that I need to brush up on my electrochem, but uh, that's that's for future. <laughs> thank you again. All right. Thank you. I guess uh, that, that'll uh, close up the seminar. Um, if anybody ever has, uh, I guess, suggestions or uh, um, questions or, or suggestions, reach out, please, um, at, at hypervalent.iodine at, 
at U Waterloo or, or just follow through our website that we have posted. Um, uh, until next time, um, I'll be it for today. Thanks, Avery. All right, thanks everybody. Have a nice day. Dave, that was a nice talk. You still there?